be here, Mr. Ambassador. Welcome and thank you. Um, we've known each other, I think, since the Clinton administration, so it's, it's great to, to have this chance to talk. Um, you um, uh, made a point in, in your remarks about uh, the importance of uh, TPP, the challenges, uh, the loss we would experience with not finishing TPP. I know you, you've been meeting with your uh, uh, nominated successors and the various people who are involved in uh, the transition uh, to the Trump administration. As you've talked with them, uh, can you share with us any of your advice to them uh, broadly about things that they should try to, problems that they should try to avoid that you might have uh, encountered, but also how to revive TPP and for that, for that case, uh, how to revive uh, trade agreement uh, negotiations with the Europeans as well? Well, uh, my advice first is to uh, roll up sleeves, open the agreement, read it, understand what's in it, uh, things that you like in it, things that you may want to improve in it, uh, and get an understanding of the dynamic of the negotiations so you can see what's really, uh, what's really possible. Uh, you know, I heard uh, a member of Congress the other day say we should renegotiate NAFTA by adding labor, the environment, and the digital economy. I, I have got a product for them. So, <laughs> very much along those lines. Uh, and so I think it's important, first and foremost, for people to get their, their arms around this. And we, should, we need to give them, the incoming administration, the time and the space, I think, to do just that. They haven't even started yet. Um, certainly, when we came in in 2009, there was a learning period. Um, uh, I, I remind my team USTR that there was a lot of uh, back and forth, full and frank exchange of views about what direction we wanted to take trade policy, and there's a mutual education process that goes on uh, as, as part of that. I think what's important is, is for people to understand that, <coughs> take TPP, just how important it is to a number of these countries for pursuing the kinds of reforms that no one would disagree with are in the United States interest. So for Vietnam to want to put disciplines around their state-owned enterprises, or to create real labor rights, real workers' rights, um, or to create real intellectual property rights. <coughs> that is in the United States' interest. And a number of these countries use TPP, whether it's Japan on agriculture, Vietnam on some of these politically sensitive issues, Malaysia on a whole series of issues. They use TPP as uh, the, the opportunity to drive reforms domestically. And it's very much in our interest that those countries succeed in reforming their economies because they are driving their economies in the direction that we want to encourage them to go. So I, I, I do hope that the incoming administration will think through whatever their views of TPP itself. How do we make sure that we are encouraging countries to pursue policies that are in the United States interests, that are in their interests as well, and that we're raising standards around the world? And I think that will be a key factor there. The administration uh, and the incoming president, uh, Donald Trump, have uh, frequently talked with rhetoric that I think it could be characterized as economic nationalist and uh, America first. Um, it, there are defenders of that approach. There are some important benefits, I'm sure, from that approach. But what is your sense of the implications of that if other nations begin to follow the same approach? and particularly with the implications for regional and multilateral trade agreements? Well, first of all, I think uh, every administration properly puts America first. Uh, certainly we did. We wanted to uh, drive more uh, manufacturing to the United States, more economic activity in the United States, more job creation, better jobs, higher wages. And it's very much our view that by opening markets abroad and by raising standards or leveling the playing field in order to create those incentives to have manufacturing in the United States and, and other economic activity to make the U.S. the United States a production platform of choice, a place where people want to make things, build things, grow things, both for this market and for markets, uh, uh, for markets all over the world. But I think you're putting your finger on a very important issue, which is that whenever you initiate a policy, you need to think through the second and third order ramifications of that policy. Um, 
not just how good it feels on day one to go out with an announcement, but what if other countries began to do the same thing? Um, you know, take, take manufacturing in the United States. Uh, that was absolutely central to our trade policy, increasing manufacturing here in the United States. It obviously is to the, the, the president elect uh, as well. But I just raised the question that if every other country said you can only have access to our market if you move your production facility to our market, what that would mean? What that would mean for manufacturing in the U.S. would uh, the folks who export the $1.3 trillion in manufacturing product around the world uh, be okay saying we're not going to export anymore? Or would they say, well, we're, that means we're going to have to close down the factory in Illinois and move it to uh, uh, Malaysia because Malaysia is buying a lot of tractors because they are investing in a lot of infrastructure. Uh, the, the growth is largely outside the United States. We're a mature economy, growing at 2 to 3 percent. We have economies around the world that are growing at 4, 5, 6, 7 percent, investing a lot of capital equipment, the kinds of things that we build well here and export. We want to be part of the market. Our preference is to build it here and export. That is what our entire trade policy has been driven towards. If other countries pursue localization policies effectively, saying you can only have access to our market if you move your manufacturing here, that has second and third order implications that we ought to think through. You mentioned and that uh, polling data suggests that the, and certainly the Pew data shows so that. I think it's your polling data. Yeah, right. <laughs> but other people's polling data show the same thing that young people, minorities, and women are the stronger supporters of globalization, trade, trade agreements, however you want to phrase the question. Um, but we also know that for the public at large, when you ask them, when we ask them, we, we're, we're going to release some data this week about what the biggest challenges facing the country and what the president of uh, Congress focus on, trade is always at the bottom of the list. In other words, they have people have opinions about it, but they don't really care about it that much relative to other things. Um, now, it, that was evident in this past campaign where uh, young people rallied, to say, to Bernie Sanders in the Democratic Party. But when you looked at the opinion of those young people about trade, they also supported trade. Uh, so they voted for Bernie Sanders for other reasons. So we shouldn't overinterpret their, uh, their vote for Bernie Sanders. But how does, if you are a Democrat, you'll be out of office soon, and the, the challenge facing the Democratic Party and people who support trade, it seems to me, is to mobilize those people who uh, say trade is good for the country, believe that globalization is here to stay, uh, but really don't make it a priority. They don't see it as an important issue that, that will galvanize them to vote. How do you, uh, what would be your advice to folks who want to use trade as an issue going forward? Well, I think you, you've, uh, pointed out a very important dynamic and shifting dynamic in public support, which is that it's not it's too easy to say Republicans are in favor of trade and Democrats aren't. We really now have internationalist and isolationist wings of both parties. And in order to have a positive trade agenda, we're gonna have to draw from the internationalists of, of, of both parties and give them the tools that they need arguments internally. I think that's where the public engagement effort is. You're right, it's, it, trade is always, when you ask about it, trade is always at the, at the bottom, but as we saw in this recent election, those who feel passionately against trade are very effective in grabbing the headlines and putting out information which may or may not have a relationship to the truth and in shaping the overall political environment in which these politicians are making, uh, are making decisions. So, our goal needs to be, I think, broadly educate, broadly engage, and, and that's where I don't think we've, to be frank, I don't think we've done enough uh, um, uh, historically. Uh, we, we've, we as a trade community here tend to get ramped up in the three months or six months. Uh, I can't say how many coalition meetings I've gone to in the city where the question was, well, you know, can you tell us when we're three months out for a vote so that we can start working to build support? And that's just not gonna work anymore. That model is not gonna work. We need to be out building support, whether or not there's a vote, and build, laying that foundation of understanding broadly in the American public. So 
that when the vote comes, and when the opposition mobilizes, people have a foundation from which to, to, to react. You know, when the opposition comes and says, you know, that, um, that trade is bad, or these trade agreements are bad, they can say, well, wait a minute, don't these trade agreements give us an opportunity to raise standards abroad? Aren't we already an open economy? You know, don't we benefit from the fact that we can export, and our export related jobs pay more than non-export related jobs? Those are the kinds of things we need to make sure American people fully understand, and that people see what's in it for them. So that not necessarily it's going to be in the top three issues that they're going to, to vote on, but that there is going to be a better foundation on which to, to build political support. This is great. I want to. I don't want to monopolize this conversation. So we're going to throw this open to uh, questions uh, from the audience. Uh, if I could ask if you could ask a question, not make a speech, that'd be great. And also, if you could identify yourself uh, in answering that question, so we know uh, where you're coming from. And uh, Matt Dessler is back there. Uh, 